the Holy Shonen Trinity, aka the Big Three. As pretentious as the name sounds, it's common knowledge in just about every anime community that the current state of the medium as we know it is due in no small part to their insane success. Whereas shows like Dragon Ball Z, Yu Yu Hakusho, and Sailor Moon introduced us over in the West to anime, the Big Three played a huge role in stoking our appetite for the stuff. As the King of Shonen Kings, One Piece stands in a class of its own as the best-selling comic book series of all time, and despite its manga ending nearly 10 years ago, the Naruto run continues to be a common sight on con floors, playgrounds, and high security government facilities alike. But then, there's Bleach. Bleach has always been a bit of a black sheep of the three with its darker, more mature tone and story. But people tend to forget that its fame and popularity for the majority of its run was equally as impossible to ignore. The ever iconic <laughs> shout is nothing short of an anime heritage moment, and Aizen still sits towards the top of many an anime villain tier list to this day. To this day! But for a decent chunk of its run, especially towards the latter half of the manga serialization, fan reception began to dip. Now, there's a lot to that whole story, and there have been many valid criticisms of the series during that time and since, but there's a good amount of videos talking about that already, and while I do recommend you watch them, I would rather spend some time emphasizing what makes this series so special while putting some respect back on the name of one of the most iconic shonen series, starting with its protagonist. Over the years, Ichigo has kind of been reduced by anime fans at large to being the final boss of the multiracial community, but I'm of the opinion that he's actually the best written main character when compared to the likes of both Naruto and Luffy. The entire plot progression of Bleach as a story is directly tied to and dependent upon Ichigo's character development and journey towards self-actualization. In fact, his only path to power is through self-acceptance, literally. Every spike in his power comes from him learning or accepting truths about himself, and this is consistent from episode 1 straight through to the Thousand Year Blood War. That said, with the amount of time and spoilers I'd have to slog through to make that point in one single video, you're probably better off just watching the show yourself, which you should still do anyways. Instead, today we're going to take a look at one of the best early examples of this idea and how it's executed in the story to help plead my case. Ichigo's fight with Zaraki Kenpachi, during his invasion of Soul Society. Right out the gate, Ichigo is not your typical shonen protagonist. At the very beginning of the first episode, he starts a four-on-one fight over what is honestly a pretty minimalistic, downright meager memorial that his opponents? Victims knocked over. All because he felt bad for the spirit of the little girl that it was left for. Badass kid with a heart of gold. Heavy on the bad though. He's also got early 2000s teen angst written all over his face, but the show wastes no time in showing us that he's got a pretty damn good reason for it. We soon learn that Ichigo's hair color brought him all of the wrong kinds of attention. He's had to fight for his own protection for most of his school life, and on top of that, he's the only person he knows that can see the spirits of the dead leaving him with quite literally existential levels of loneliness. He's trying to do the best with what he's got while navigating a world that nobody could possibly understand. Then there's his home life where he has to contend with his overprotective try-hard of a father, making Ichigo seemingly the only mature man in the house with two younger sisters to watch out for. Everyone tries to give him space whenever they can sense that he needs it, knowing that he's got a lot on his plate to manage especially since he just so happens to also carry the trauma of watching their mother die. Yeah, if this were me, I think I'd also have a permanent scowl stuck to my face too. All that said though, that heart of gold of his still manages to shine through. He doesn't really seem to have any issues with attendance, behavior, or academics now that he's in high school, and he even has a decent social circle. For all intents and purposes, he's working pretty hard to manage his unknowably chaotic life, and he's actually managing pretty well. That is, of course, until he learns from a soul reaper named Rukia that his abilities are due to having an unnaturally high amount of spirit energy for a human, which then acts as a beacon for evil spirits called Hollows, who eat other spirits in order to get stronger. Interestingly enough, however, despite all of his newfound power, 
He initially rejects the role of a Soul Reaper until he's able to come up with his own reasons that he can confidently stand behind for himself. At the time, this was pretty groundbreaking stuff as far as main characters with godly powers go into Battle Shonen. And in taking the time out to process his new reality for himself, he actually forms the foundation for every one of his motivations and actions moving forwards. From this point on, Every major battle Ichigo has is a direct test of this newfound mentality and resolve, and his ability to adapt or even discard it for the sake of something more beneficial, and more importantly more authentic to himself, is what determines whether or not he'll overcome the obstacle at hand. More on that in a bit. Once the Fed, I mean Byakuya and Renji, show up to take Rukia back to their home, it's this very same resolve that drives Ichigo to put in the necessary, grueling effort to try to bring her back. This eventually puts him on the road to his round two with Renji, aka his first true clash of ideals. Unlike his previous opponents up until now, Renji forces Ichigo to put his life on the line for what he believes in, allowing him to truly take in the gravity of the world he's decided to step into. Still, even this can be seen as a warm-up in comparison to what would come next. So the first really cool thing about this encounter is that it's actually a huge contrast with Ichigo's fight with Renji. Whereas Renji's motivations came from a place of well thought out reason, your boy Kenpachi literally just came to throw hands. That is all the reason he needs to justify a deathmatch. As a walking combat machine who is always looking for the smoke, it's easy to see that the theme of this match, the challenge presented to Ichigo's ideals this time around, is fear. There's a little more to it than that though. When you pay close attention, this fear that Ichigo's confronting isn't just the fear of death or failure. This fight is about the fear Ichigo has of himself, or more specifically, the fear of his darker impulses. Hear me out. When I was rewatching this fight, I couldn't help but notice how similar Ichigo and Kenpachi actually are. In a way, Zaraki acts as a bit of a reflection of Ichigo's most violent tendencies, and you can see this reflection in how they deal with each other in combat. Both of these lunatics are unorthodox, brute force fighters. So when Kenpachi grabs Zangetsu by the blade to give him a little extra leverage for a straight thrust, Ichigo impressively manages to dodge. It's not so much that they're at a similar skill level, that much becomes painfully obvious very soon, they're both just kind of cracked in similar ways. Letting this get to his head, Ichigo assumes then that he has an edge once he learns that Kenpachi doesn't have a Shikai, earning him a painful lesson in how Shinigami powers work and in humility. And then, the real fun begins. Suddenly, old man Zangetsu appears and brings Ichigo into his inner world for the first time proper. Right away, Ichigo is thrown off by its confusing and disorienting nature, which makes a lot of sense when you realize Ichigo doesn't really know anything at all about himself yet. This is made even more apparent once the third member of the party finally makes his appearance. Once he's rejected by Zangetsu, an all-white copy of Ichigo named, well, White, shows up to try to steal the power away from him by attacking Ichigo in an unorthodox, highly aggressive style. See where we're going with this? Interestingly enough, Ichigo actually spends the majority of the series outright denying this part of himself. He never adopts a single one of White's fighting techniques, and despite being told by old man Zagetsu himself that White is generally a version of Ichigo himself, he refuses to accept him and has to fight him for control of his mind and body. Constantly. It's not until the Blade is me that he fully integrates this and all other aspects of himself finally giving him access to the full range of his potential at will. It's not even just that he doesn't fully know himself by this point of the series. He's actually at war within himself. On the surface, he's done a pretty fantastic job at holding it all together, but it's here that he learns just how disconnected he's become, or maybe has always been, from himself. For Ichigo, looking inwards can't just be a one-off. He's got to continue developing himself, and thereby his abilities, if he's going to continue making it anymore. When he decided to step into the role of Shinigami, he didn't just wake up to a fancy big sword TM, he woke up to himself. Meaning, he's only just barely scratching the surface of what he's actually capable of. This is even more clear once you learn that White is the actual manifestation of Ichigo's Shinigami powers, 
and that up until the final arc of the series, Old Man Zangetsu's only been giving him access to tiny bits of that power. Stingy old man. By the way, since we're on the topic, this is also the reason why Ichigo's always pulling a new power-up or ability out of seemingly nowhere. Whenever the situation seems dire, Old Man Zangetsu releases just a bit more of Ichigo's latent abilities, White's abilities, in order to help him survive. Since he's not fully at peace within himself, however, this tends to lead to Ichigo going berserk whenever that happens. Now that he's centered himself and has a greater reverence for the power he holds, Ichigo is finally able to return to the fight with Kenpachi with a much calmer, dare I say even mature, head. He's about to begin their final face-off when what do you know? Ichigo's freshly renewed spirit energy now takes the form of his hollow mask. Regardless of what you may or may not have heard about this series, this is some crazy airtight storytelling with just a little bit of foreshadowing mixed in to help keep things interesting later on down the road. And this series has just barely started picking up speed. I didn't even mention the fact that Ichigo's had Quincy symbols displayed around his house as early and as clearly as episode 2, or that Ichigo was able to identify Yachiru as being non-human within seconds of meeting her, or that Urahara's discovery that hollows are toxic to Quincy's explains why Ichigo's mother had to- Okay, okay, I did promise that we'd keep it focused on Kenpachi today, but... To be honest, this entire video was really just a justification for me to nerd out about what is easily my favorite series of my adolescence. And hey, you're still here, so uh, I'm gonna go ahead and assume that one, it doesn't really bother you all that much, because two, videos like these are your thing. And if that's the case, thanks for hanging out. If you enjoyed it, feel free to like the video and subscribe if you'd be down for more videos like this in the future. See you soon. Peace.